All right, we ready? All right, so let's go ahead and dive into some Bible study here. So before we get to the book of Exodus, let's do a little review, kind of get our minds focused. So let me ask you, Team Grace, what does the word Bible mean? Library. library. And how many books are in this library? 73 books. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. What event or what person distinguishes the Old Testament from the New Testament? Exactly, Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament is preparing for the Messiah, the anointed Savior. The New Testament is He arrived, He brought salvation, and it's the history of the early church. How many main parts are there in the Old Testament? Four. Four. What's the first part? The Pentateuch. How many books? What's the second part? Historical. How many books? Sixteen. What's the third part? Wisdom. How many books? What's the fourth part? Prophetic. How many books? 18. How many books total in the Old Testament? 46 books. Exactly. 46 books. Do all Catholics and Protestants agree on that? No, regrettably not. How many books are in discrepancy? Seven. What do we call those books properly? The Deuterocanonicals. Exactly. The Deuterocanonicals. What's the foundation of the entire Old Testament? The Pentateuch. What's the foundation of the entire Old Testament? The Pentateuch, exactly. Are there any deuterocanonicals in the Pentateuch? No, thanks be to God. All Catholics and Protestants agree on the five books of Moses, the five books of the Pentateuch. And that's important, essential, in order for us to understand the Old Testament. Okay, so good, that's the Old Testament. How many main major parts are there of the New Testament? Four. What's the first part? The Gospels, exactly. And how many books? How many, what's the second part of the New Testament? Historical. How many books? One. What is it? Acts of the Apostles. Exactly. What's the third part of the New Testament? Letters. The Apostolic Letters. How many letters? 21. Let me ask you this. How many of those letters were written or influenced by St. Paul? 14. How many were written by other apostles? Seven. Those are called the universal letters or the Catholic letters. So the letter of James which we're hearing from in the sacred liturgy on Sunday, that's one of the universal letters. It's written by James, one of the other apostles. So how many letters total? 21. What's the fourth part of the New Testament? The Apocalypse. How many books? What's that book? Revelation. Revelation. So how many books in the New Testament? 27. 27 in the New Testament, 46 in the Old Testament for a total of how many books? 73 books, exactly. Wow, look at us, huh? Thanks be to God. Let's look at the Pentateuch. What's the first book of the Pentateuch? What's the second book? And that's where we've been so far, right? So we had Genesis. You can go back and follow daily discipleship. You can follow that whole Bible study. It took us a couple years. Remember that? To get to... I remember I was a lot younger then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we went through Genesis point by point by point by point, right? And then we moved into Exodus. And here we are in Exodus. So we have two books, the first two books of the Bible. They're also the first two what? First two narrative books. Exactly, right? How many narrative books total? If I want the basic story of salvation, do I have to read all 73 books? Nope, nope, nope. If I want the basic story of salvation, how many books do I have to read? And those books are called? The narrative books. So we have Genesis, narrative book. Exodus, narrative book. This is great. But what's the third book of the Old Testament? Leviticus. Whew, that's a hard one, isn't it? Now, I keep joking about Leviticus, but one of these days, I would like to do a Bible study on Leviticus because it's actually formatted in all structure with the Feast of Atonement is right in the center and everything flows to, goes to it or flows from it. The whole book of Leviticus is designed around the Feast of Atonement, right? Powerful, powerful. But you've got to really work on it. So I would want to do that Bible study, but I know that none, none of you would show up, right? <laughs> Or you come to the first session and say, ain't no way, ain't no how, right? right? Because Leviticus is what? It's a priest's handbook, exactly. So obviously it makes sense. I'm a priest of the New Covenant. I'm kind of like, oh, kind of, kind of partial to the priest's handbook, right? It's a priest of the Old Testament, right? But it's a beautiful book. There's a lot of catechesis teaching there, but it's hard. What's the fourth book of the Pentateuch? Numbers, numbers. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. You know my opinion about that one, don't you? There's a lot of what? My goodness, it's like, do you have to count every, like, every three, two, one chapters? It's like, come on, right? 
I like how in the Hebrew Bible, what's the Hebrew Bible called again? The Torah is the first part. So the Torah is what we call the Pentateuch. What's the entire Old Testament, our Old Testament called? The Tanakh, the Tanakh, right? So if you go to the Tanakh, the Torah properly, because we're still in the Pentateuch, the Jewish tradition doesn't call it numbers. They're smart. See, they catch you. Because you think, hey, let's get together and read the book of Numbers. Like, yeah, hey, no, right? <laughs> but if we get together and we use the Jewish name, right? Hey, let's get together and read the book of what? In the Wilderness. It's like, wow, that sounds like Narnia, right? It's like, yeah. Yeah, they, they got us, right? So the fourth book in our tradition is called Numbers. What's the fifth book? Deuteronomy. We're going to talk a little bit about Deuter Deuteronomy tonight with Exodus 20. But Deuteronomy is what? Moses' last will and testament. Exactly. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay. All right. So we have a little bit of context. We good to go? All right. Let's go to the scriptures. Let's go to the book of Exodus. We're at Exodus chapter 20. And what I want to do is before we dive into chapter 20, I want us to just pick up the end of chapter 19 again. Because God is saying something at Mount Sinai. Now remember this is 50 days after the liberation. So we had Passover. God liberates his people from slavery. 50 days later, on the Feast of Pentecost, God is now ratifying the covenant he made there at Mount Sinai. That's pretty powerful, right? We realize... Passover, Pentecost, this is the Old Testament. Then we realize what Jesus Christ has done, the Paschal mystery, he has fulfilled the Passover. Wow. 50 days later, he sends the Holy Spirit to ratify the covenant he made at the, during, for the feast of what? Pentecost. It's the same feast day, right? So just as the Lord fulfilled Passover, the Lord is also fulfilling Pentecost. This whole part of Pentecost is almost completely lost on the people of God today. The connection between the Old Testament Pentecost and the New Ten Testament Pentecost completely misunderstood, if it's known at all. But we have to look here at what God's doing at the first Pentecost. He's ratifying the covenant. He's giving his law. He's saying, this is what it means to be a member of my people. Let's look at what Jesus Christ has done. Paschal mystery, the fulfilled Passover. 50 days later, he sends the Holy Spirit upon us in order to teach us how to be his people. Same thing. Fulfillment, fulfillment. Okay, let's look at the end of uh, chapter 19. Let's just look at verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 24. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up bringing Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. So here we see again Moses, and now Aaron is being this type of intercessor between God and his people. Let's go a little bit earlier in the passage. Let me see here. Okay, look at verse 7. So, this is leading into this interaction between Moses and then Moses and then God's people to God. So Moses came down and came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. So again, we're seeing this parallel between the Old Testament Pentecost, New Testament Pentecost. And here in chapter 19, what God is ultimately saying to his people is, listen, I spared you from slavery. I want you to be my special people, my special possession. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. But you're going to have to listen to me. You're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to do what I have said. God is forming a covenant with his people through Moses. Moses is there. We see him as his intercessor walking up and down the mountain, right? And Moses is an old guy, but he's still doing it, right? And we see this covenant being formed between God and his people. Now, what's amazing about that? is the difference between a covenant and a contract, right? Those of you who are with me for the formation day this past Saturday, you know what I'm talking about. 
Because a contract is an exchange of goods. You give me this, I give you that, right? In a society that uses money, it's I give you a service or a product and you give me money, right? Quid pro quo, it's a contract, right? So there's no relationship, we're not friends, we're not gonna hang out, right? So as I said before, you know, it's like I go to the restaurant, when I go to a restaurant, which I try not to do. <laughs> you ever notice going to restaurants now, it's just so stressful, right? It's like the food stinks, the service stinks. It's like, why am I here, right? <laughs> Spending money, I could just be saving, right? Okay. But you go to the restaurant now sometimes, and they walk up and say, hello, my name is Jerry. I'll be your server. It's like, uh, Jerry, I don't care. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't care about your name. Don't want to be your friend. You know, like, you're a human being. You have dignity. God loves you. I will respect you. But don't need you to know your name. We're not friends. We're not going to hang out on the weekends. Like, why are you doing this, right? This is a contract. I order. You get my food. You bring it. I pay. I leave. That's it. It's a contract, right? So don't blur with familiarity what is actually just an exchange of goods and services, right? You know? By the way, we don't know this now because... We kind of just destroy all kinds of manners and everything like this thing. And things change, right? But, but you know, if you're at a formal dinner and the person's coming, they're bringing you your food. You know, like, do like, do like, they, they do like that. <laughs> right? You know? It is actually bad manners to say thank you. You're not supposed to say thank you. You're actually disturbing and distracting them. So it's like, No, you're not supposed to be saying thank you. Because otherwise, if it's a table of 25, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. They're working. Leave them alone, right? But as Americans, we're very egalitarian, so it's like I'm awkward, someone's serving me, so I'm going to say thank you, and so on, because we're, we're going to act like we're friends, but we're really not, because I really, I don't know if I really am grateful. It's like I'm just glad that you brought me my food, but... I really would be grateful you just kept going, right? <laughs> right? You see? Contract, right? You know what I'm talking about. Even if you don't agree with my examples, you know what I'm talking about. Where someone just assumes familiarity, it's just like, that's really awkward. <laughs> okay, right? okay, so that's a contract, exchange of goods and services. But a covenant, here we go, here we go. A covenant is different, right? A covenant is when two become one when there is familiarity and the forming of a family. What? So for example, a wedding. Man and woman, separate, come together, the two become one. Covenant, that's it, great. Let's go to an example in the ancient world. We got tribe A and tribe B. Tribe A, you guys are great hunters. You go with your bad selves, okay, right? You guys are terrible hunters, but you can farm. You know, talking about some massive good vegetables, okay? After a while, you're like, we want meat. And you guys, I know it's hard to believe, but you're thinking, we want vegetables, right? <laughs> right? right? No paleo diet going on here, okay? <laughs> so you can either engage in battle, trying to steal vegetables and steal meat, right? that's an option. Or tribe A and tribe B can come together and become one tribe and mutually exchange the goods as family. And if there's a bad harvest, well, they still get the meat. Or the herd's just kind of crazy and the meat's just not there, they still get the you still get the vegetables. Because it's not quid pro quo, it's family. So the point is that this now big family supports itself. So we can understand this. And this would mainly happen because one person from this tribe would marry this person from this tribe. Usually the leader's children, right? The chief's daughter would marry the chief's son. You know. That's the most common. But there are covenants known as brotherhood covenants. So for example, in 1 Samuel, we'll see a brother covenant between King David and, um, and Jonathan. Right? So the heir apparent. Saul's son, the prince. Right? So they form a brotherhood covenant, which means 
There are brothers. The two have now become one. The two peoples are united. Right? So covenant is very important. Now normally, when there's a covenant, there's still an exchange of goods. So it's like a contract, but it's more important. It's higher elevated than just a mere contract. But there's an exchange of goods. Like You guys aren't going to say, hey, we're going to give you our meat, and you guys don't have to give us anything. You would never do that, <laughs> okay, right? There has to be something else that's being given. So what's interesting is that when God forms a covenant with us, so he's making us a part of his people, his family, there's nothing we can give him. That's awkward. There's nothing we can give to him. He forms a covenant in sheer goodness out of love. In order to help us, he says, as we see in chapter 19 of Exodus, I will form this covenant with you. You will become my people, but you have to listen to me and trust me. Aha, so there it is. What St. Paul will call in the New Testament, the New Covenant, the obedience of faith. Obedience means to listen, to comply. So the obedience of faith. Okay, good. Now this is something I, we can give. I can give, right? And the gratitude of being invited into God's family and to have a covenant formed with us should provoke us to seek to follow this covenant faithfully. So in Moses now we see this covenant established. Now we've had a few other covenants in salvation history, haven't we? Who was the first covenant with? With Adam. Right? And who was the second covenant? Noah, right? So that kind of, you know, they, God tried again, right? Who's the third covenant with? Abraham, exactly. Abraham, Father Abraham, right? And now we get to the fourth covenant with Moses. Now every covenant builds on the previous covenant. So there's blessings and there's applications. So the original covenant with Adam was a married couple. Adam and Eve. That's it. Then when Noah's covenant was formed, it built, it absorbed the covenant with, with, with Adam, and now it's with a family. It was Noah, his wife, and his children, and his son's wives. Right? So now we go from a married couple to a family. See how it is? It's expanding. And more blessings are being given, and more blessings are being given. Some of you who are about my age or older, you will, you will remember this that when we were in science class, oftentimes in middle school, we got to dissect a frog, remember that? Now they're talking about frog rights, okay, you know? It's like, I don't know about that, or people identify as a frog now, okay, you know? It's like, excuse me, you know, didn't mean to like rip apart your ancestor or something, okay? But remember that, we got to dissect a frog, first you had to start with a worm and then you got to work up to a frog, yeah? And this is before all the technology and stuff. Remember we had that big lab manual? And you had to do like this, like. <laughs> okay, good, that thing's open, right? It's like we're ready to go, huh? And remember originally it was just the outline of the frog? It's like, that's a good looking frog. But remember it's just the outline of the frog? And then you had to turn the sheet and you saw his circulatory system, yeah? And then you turn the sheet, you saw his muscles. And, I'm sorry, he or she, excuse me, I'll be inclusive. <laughs> and you just keep turning the sheet, you see more and more and more. And then when you're all done, <coughs> you got the whole frog, right? That's my frog, okay? That's what covenants do. We have this humanity, the people of God, and God forms a covenant. It's like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And then he does, he brings another one. Here's another covenant. It's like. Wow, and then here's another covenant. And we understand more about God and more people are the recipients of the blessings with each covenant. So when we get to Moses, God's going to form this covenant with Moses, with us through Moses. But he's giving us a condition that we're going to have to listen to him. Trust him enough to follow his way. So the way of the Lord which actually was first used by Abraham in Genesis, 
is a very common term. Now, we hear the way of the Lord, we think of the Lord Jesus. That's good. The Lord was building on that, right? But from the time of Abraham, all through salvation history, the Lord is describing his way. And his way are not, is not the way of the unbeliever. His way is not the way of the other nations. His way is uniquely his. It's his way. So now what happens is God's telling his people there at Mount Sinai, I'm going to form a covenant with you. You have to trust me. And he's going to start describing this covenant. Let's go to chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words. So remember, there's smoke and there's an earthquake. And there's, it's like, the, it's like we think of the description of Pentecost in the New Testament. All this is happening. I mean, the Old Testament is fulfilling this. So the earth is shaking. There's clouds. There, there's smoke. There's, everything is just crazy. And in the midst of that, God speaks. Verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And all, the God, all God's people are saying, yep, yeah, we remember that. We remember that. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay, so that's, that's a good step, right? If you're going to be in a covenant with God, you could probably, probably would want to say, like, okay, we're going to worship God, right? <laughs> so say, okay, no, we want your covenant and your blessings, but we're going to worship, you know, this uh, frog god. Or the Nag. I remember all those plagues were reflections of the Egyptian gods. You've got to be pretty messed up to worship a gnat god, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously, like, who likes gnats? Like, you know what? We're going on vacation. You know where we're going? Like, where's that? Going down in low country in Charleston? Gnats everywhere. <laughs> it's like, that's where you're going. Talk about wonderful. Woo! Yeah. I can just say, do some reading, gnats all over my face. Like, no one has ever said that, okay? who has mental capacity, all right? So the Egyptians are worshiping all these other gods, and the Lord says at Mount Sinai, 50 days after the Passover, 50 days after liberation, I am God. And you know who I am because I brought you out of slavery. So you can have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is, that is in the earth below or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Woo. All right, let's break that down. A lot of teaching there. So first, God knows that if his people are going to remain faithful that they're not going to be able to engage in any form of images because they're going to be inclined. Remember, it's only been a little under two months since their freedom from Egypt. They were surrounded by the Egyptian gods and the false worship of the Egyptian people. So God says, that's it, no images, nothing. I want no images. And then he says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. So first of all, notice that when he speaks of these images, he speaks of them as if they're living. Because they could be. So our spiritual tradition has always said that the false gods of Egypt, Rome, Greece, were all demons. And no one can pretend to be God better than a demon. So that's it. And then the Lord says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And you might say, well, how can he be a jealous God? Isn't jealousy wrong? And then we have to be very careful. So first someone can say, well, what can he be jealous about? He's God. You know, was he a little insecure? <laughs> you know? What he's jealous about is the one thing that we can give to something else that belongs to him, and that's our heart. He's the Father and the Lord of all, heaven and earth. But he gives us our freedom. We have to surrender our hearts to him. And we can choose to give our hearts to a false god or to something else. We make that decision. Now, we have to understand jealousy is different from envy. Jealousy is someone has something that I want. Envy is when someone has something that I want and I think that I should have it 
and I will do whatever is necessary in order to get it. Right? So jealousy could be, wow, look at those nice glasses, Susie. Huh, very nice. I wish I had glasses like that. Yeah. <laughs> My life's so hard. <laughs> She's got nice glasses like that. That's jealousy, right? That could be jealousy. Right. Envy is, look at those glasses. Uh-huh. Susie goes use the bathroom. Okay. Five finger discount, right? Yeah? Or Susie's walking to her car and I'm like, hey lady, give me them glasses. <laughs> okay, right? So I'm going to take what she has that I think I should have. That's envy, right? So in its purest form, jealousy, with all these understandings, at times can be virtuous. So for example, if a spouse is giving their affection to someone else that belongs to their spouse, and the spouse is jealous, and this is within the realms of justice, that can actually be a virtue. Because the spouse is showing that they love their spouse and want the affection of their spouse. Right? Pretty good. So when God says, I am jealous, he's saying, you are going to give, might want to give your heart to some other thing rather than to me, and I am a jealous God. Now that shows us right away that this God living in true has no problems being vulnerable. That's a lot of power he's given to us, isn't it? You'll worship no other images. You'll worship no other false gods except me. I'm the one who saved you from, from slavery. I'm the one who brought you out of bondage. You will worship nothing else because I'm a jealous God. Wow, that is an intensity of love that is full vulnerability. And he's telling us, I'm a jealous God, don't do it. Then look. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, there's this whole movement of some people. Be careful of self-proclaimed exorcists. I feel like every time I go on YouTube, the priest says, I'm an exorcist. I kind of feel like insecure, right? Because I'm not an exorcist, okay? Because everyone's claiming to be an exorcist. Right. Like you can't all be exorcists. Right. So let me make this clear. Anytime someone tells you they're an exorcist, ask them for the apostolic letter of appointment. So I tell you, I'm a censor laborum. Means I have the power to censor books. And you're like, what? Yeah. You're like, show me the letter. I can show you the letter. In the Diocese of Charleston, the Bishop of Charleston has appointed me the censor laborum. I can censor a book. Yeah, right, right? I mean, it's his authority. I better watch out, you know? But someone says they're an exorcist. Show me the letter. What bishop, what successor of the apostles has appointed you as a, an exorcist? And we've got a lot of these people floating around. They're self-proclaimed. They're writing their own little prayers. They're giving themselves their own nihil obstat, which you can't do that. Like, the censor gives a nihil obstat. That means it's good. You, you can trust it. Usually when there's a nihil obstat, then the bishop gives an imprimatur. You can't give your own works the authorization. So they're writing their own prayers. They're doing all this stuff. And this part of the scripture, they keep quoting among some others. Like, there are things called generational sin, and you're going to have to um, do these 12 prayers for the next three months walking backwards. Um, you uh, have to fast, and you can't wipe your butt when you use the bathroom. You know, I mean, it's just like peculiar, weird stuff. It's like, what? Where did this come from? Right? But they speak with such authority, and well, you know, they're an exorcist. You know, like, no, they're a kook. Right? <laughs> you know? Like, what, what is the Lord speaking about here? First of all, we know that he will tell us later that he will never make a child suffer for the sin of the child's parents. The sin of the child's parents. He will not. So if a child is there, an adult child, and the, the parent commits a sin, the child will not suffer. No punishment of the parent will be inflicted upon the child. That's the foundation, one of the foundational laws of, the, of Moses. Right? 
We forget that when God said children can't be punished for their parents and when God says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, which to us sounds harsh, realize that in that time, you took someone's eye, they killed your whole village. You took someone's tooth, they destroyed your entire herd. So an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was very restrictive at that time. God was forming and molding his people with an understanding of justice. Right? And the idea of justice, one eye for one eye, one tooth for one tooth. Oh, come on, we'll take their whole village out. No. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's it. And you can't inflict a punishment of, of a parent on the child. You can't do that. That violates justice. So God is very clear in other parts of the scriptures. So why do these self-proclaimed exorcists exaggerate these parts of the scriptures and make people feel that they somehow bear guilt for sins that they've never committed? And then they create these exotic devotionals and prayers, the vast majority of which do not have imprimaturs, have never been reviewed by a bishop, and the faith are actually doing this. They think they have to. Well, you know, it says here, like, they quoted the Bible. Yeah, but you know what? They're making the Protestants jealous because they're just cherry-picking verses. You have to read the entire corpus of the Scriptures and understand. So what is God saying here? Well, this is how this, is how this applies. If you grow up and you see your mom and dad going to confession, you are nine times more likely to do what? Go to confession, right? Pope St. John Paul II the Great tells us that every morning when he would come back from Mass, because he would serve Mass, then he'd have to help in the sacristy, his father would go home, they were in an apartment right next door to the church, father would go home in order to prepare breakfast, after the breakfast was done, he would wait for his son to come back. Little Karawoy Tiwa, future John Paul II, would come back, and he would walk in, he would see his dad kneeling, praying to the Holy Spirit. Dad, I'm back. Okay. Then they'd sit down and have breakfast together. Because of that, John Paul II had a profound and deep devotion to the Holy Spirit. Earlier when we were speaking to the parents, it's like, you do it, no matter what your kids tell you. I hate you. I'm sorry. I don't want to be around you. But they're watching and they're going to do what you do. For good? Or this passage, for ill. They sit around, they see dad just slacking off, doing nothing. Mom and dad are always fighting. Dad's drinking, mom's taking too many prescription drugs. Hit and miss with, with mass. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to continue what they've seen. Because they think that's normal. That's the passing of the generational sin. God's saying, if you don't follow my way and you follow other ways, this is going to fall upon the future generations of your family. Follow my way, you'll be blessed. Your children will watch and they will follow my way. Don't follow my way, do these other things and your children will watch and that will become the generational sin. They'll think that's normal. Isn't it odd for most of us when we first left home, whether it's for to work or the military or for college, and we realized like how messed up our families were. <laughs> right? Do you remember that? You know, you're like there at college, you're like, oh, you don't do that, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no. It's like, oh, yeah, we don't either. <laughs> right? It's okay, it's part of growing up, right? Like, this is where works in progress, so are our families, right? But suddenly there's this objectivity. We say we've been mugged by reality, right? It's like, you mean that's not normal? And sometimes, that can actually break those generational sins. So a young person can look and say, this is what I like about mom, this is what I like about dad, these are all the good things, and these are the things that I don't like and aren't good, and I'm not going to continue those. Right? So the generational sin stops. But for the young person who never has that experience, then they think part of the brokenness or the sin of their parents is normal, and they continue it. Okay, so this is what the Lord's speaking about. Verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guileless who takes his name in vain. Verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath 
to the Lord your God in it. You shall not do any work, you or your son, your daughter, your manservant, or your maidservant, or your cattle, or the sojourner who is within your gates. So even the animals get to rest. And the stranger, even the stranger, you can't have the stranger come and say, I'll feed you, but you've got to work the fields. You can't do that on the Sabbath. Even the stranger benefits from charity and hospitality on the Sabbath. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Look at that. So blessing and even older age is given when one honors their parents. And parents, you don't need to hear this from me, um, but times have changed, haven't they? Because sometimes when I'm in public and I see the way that young people speak to their parents, I, I, I'm honestly just appalled and scandalized. You know? I think I spoke to my mom harshly once. And it happened to be the day my dad came home early from work. So after I picked myself up off the ground, <laughs> you know, I realized that's not appropriate, <laughs> okay? You know? Or well, one time we were really, really giving my mom a hard time. And my dad came home, my mom ratted us out, you know. He would always say, we change, we'll be better, please don't tell dad. You know that, right? You know? You know? And my dad sat us down. And I, don't know, I think I was maybe nine or ten. Just when you think you believe everything your dad's telling you, you know? And he said to me, to my brother and sister, to three of us, she's my wife before she's your mother, and I will let no one mistreat my wife. So if you do it again, you can get out. I remember being shocked, because I really believe the old man would have kicked us out. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? So it was like, oh, so suddenly it's, mom's not ours. Mom is first dad's. And dad honors mom. So we better get our act together, right? So the way that some young people speak to their parents, the way that their parents let them speak to them is, is, is not preparing for success. It's not virtuous, it's not good. And then of course the way that young people treat their parents is the way that they're gonna treat their future employers. I like when young people say, yeah, I quit that job. Oh, really? Yeah, my, job, my boss was a real jerk. Why? Well, you know, I was late a couple of times. <laughs> I was late a couple of times. And did those, it's basically like all these violations of justice and professionalism. It's like, and your boss was a jerk because he fired you, right? That's called a boss, right? Remember that contract covenant? Your boss is not your friend, right? That's your boss, right? So, okay. So, here... We are being commanded to honor our father and our mother. And then you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not cover your neighbor's house, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people perceive the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood afar off. And said to Moses, you speak to us and we will hear, but let not God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to you, and that, you, and, and that the fear of him may, before, may be before your eyes, that you may not sin. So here's the Ten Commandments. And the people, because of, again, this first Pentecost is very dramatic, it, they, they get scared. And remember I said last week how, watch this fear. So... God has revealed himself to being and saying, I'm the one who saved you from slavery. I brought you out of bondage. Remember all those plagues that I did to save you? So God is identifying himself and he's saying, here is how you are to live. And because of the, the smoke and the earth quaking and, and, and the thunder and the lightning, God's people are, are more and more being consumed by fear to the point where they say to Moses, tell God we don't, he doesn't have to speak to us you speak to us, and, and, and we'll listen to you, and then you talk to God for us. God wants to have communication with his people. No, 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 just, just, just right here. Just do this. So let's look at these Ten Commandments. When I was a newly ordained priest, I was in Aiken, and I asked a bunch of parents 
that first year, because a lot of the young people were going off to college, it was a very close-knit parish like we are, and a lot of young people were going off to college, and so I knew a lot of the families. And so I asked the parents, I said, I want to give a, a strong homily, that's out of the ordinary for me, and um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to give a strong homily, so what, what words of wisdom do you want to pass on to your children? What, what do you want me to stress as they prepare to go off to college, you know? And over the course of a while, I began to meet with different parents and dinners and stuff and ask this question. So just taking notes, taking notes. And then I was preparing the homily and I just had to laugh out loud. Because here's, here's a quick summary. Don't think that you're always the center of everything. Always look outside your heart. Be careful where your heart might lead you. Don't speak harshly or use profanity. Make sure you get to church every Sunday. Make sure you make some friends at church. Call home and let us know how you're doing, like, you know, signs of life, you know? Don't lie or cheat, just acknowledge where you are. Don't bully other people or isolate other people. Get to know people, but be careful about who you get close to. And don't sleep around. Don't abuse alcohol or take drugs. Be honest with your professors when you need help. Be happy with where you are and don't always want what everybody else has. Do you see what's going on? As I compo compose these, this wisdom from parents to their children who are going to college, they basically summarized the Ten Commandments. So they were summarizing from their role as a parent, as mother and father, here's what you need to do in order to be happy, to have a good life, to be a respectable person, right? to be a good Christian. Right? And they paralleled the Ten Commandments. That's why when I was reading, I went from laughing to crying. I thought, this is powerful. Because God's not giving the Ten Commandments because he's showing us his power. He's like, you better do this. He formed a covenant with us when we couldn't give anything to him. And he says, I'm just going to ask you to trust me and follow my way. This is the way of the Lord. Here's how you need to live in order that you might truly live and be happy. And yet still so oftentimes we approach the moral law because this law is still binding. Now we have even the grace of God that's even more powerful for us to live it. But oftentimes we approach the moral law and we want to try to circumvent it or avoid it or cut corners and then we act shocked when there's betrayal and misery and misunderstanding and brokenness and hurt. It's like, well, of course there would be. God's describing exactly what it means to be a human being, to live in the fullness of life. So if we trust him, we follow his way, he's able to bless us and protect us. Now, it's interesting is we have two accounts of the Ten Commandments. Here, Exodus 20, and then in Deuteronomy 6. So Deuteronomy 6, five weeks before Moses dies, he assembles God's people there at Mount Moab, and he says, let me tell you and remind you of what God has done, and he repeats the Ten Commandments. But you know what's interesting? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers are all from God's perspective. Deuteronomy is from Moses' perspective. This is an elder of God's people, a friend of God who's speaking. The whole tone and the approach is different in Deuteronomy. And so when Moses gets to the Ten Commandments, he kind of gives a little bit of commentary. Right? He kind of develops things. Right? You might not be aware that the list for the Ten Commandments are different between Catholics and Protestants. Some time ago, someone bought me a plaque of the Ten Commandments. They were being very gracious, so I thanked them, but they didn't realize that it was the Protestant version. Because the Protestants actually have four commandments, the first four relating to God, because they add about no graven images. Part of that was done in order to just bust the chops of the Catholics. Right? So the first four, because they break up God's instructions. So you have four relating to God, six relating to our neighbor. As Catholics, in the more traditional view is, there are two tablets, the first three pertain to God, the last seven pertain to one another. So the first tablet, God alone, Honor his name and honor the Sabbath. It's our relationship with God. The last seven is our interaction with one another. So honoring our mother and father, not committing murder, not committing adultery, not lying or stealing. 
not bearing false witness, not desiring our neighbor's wife, not de desiring our neighbor's goods. So the last seven are about our interaction with one another. And one could say that it's because of Exodus 20 and the developed explanation of the Ten Commandments in uh, Deuteronomy 6 that we have this difference in the Catholic, the Catholic list summarizes and more follows Deuteronomy. The Protestant list follows more Exodus 20. That's if we want to be really, really kind theologically. Right? But in the end, the Protestant list was really composed in order to bust our chops. No graven image, because the Protestant theology saw statues and stained glass and various things as graven images. So that was the cultural context for this different listing, numbering of the Ten Commandments. So far, so good? So what we're going to do next week is we're going to wrap up that last part of chapter 19, it's going to be uh, last part of chapter 20, and then we're going to see where the Lord takes us. Sound good? All right, see you next week. Thank you.